right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back today with somebody I'm very excited to talk with. He is all-knowing and uh, kind of an oracle in geopolitical affairs, and one of my favorite uh, commentators on it. Uh, we got Ben Norton. How are you doing today, Ben? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. And uh, thank you for the, the much-too-kind introduction. <laughs> Uh, you run a geopolitical economy report, which uh, YouTube and uh, news site and everything. I encourage everybody to go check it out. It is sort of unbelievably uh, concise and informative. And you've also, you know, done BBC, Sky News, Al Jazeera, Democracy. Now, you name it, you've sort of been there. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. Now, now we couldn't start out without really talking about Gaza. I mean, what's going on in Israel right now and the sort of dichotomy of what the Western media is saying and how we actually feel as uh, voters and stuff. So let's talk about the um, this time that uh, and I mentioned to you before we started recording. This isn't the first time the United States or any of these Western powers, Israel, United States, has been taken to the ICJ. Can you talk about the Nicaragua? Yeah, well, actually, there are two different precedents. There's another precedent as well. When Israel was taken to the International Court of Justice over the construction of what people commonly call the apartheid wall, or the separation wall in the West Bank, which, according to international law, is a legally occupied territory. And in that previous ICJ case, Israel also lost. So that there are two cases now in which Israel has, has lost a case at the ICJ. In, in terms of Nicaragua's case, in the 1980s, people might know that the U.S. backed essentially a terror war against Nicaragua, and the Reagan administration, re administration supported the Contras, and that stands in Spanish, Contra Revolucionario, which means counter-revolutionary. That was what they called themselves. And they were fighting against the revolutionary Sandinista government that came to power in 1979 that overthrew a brutal right-wing dictator who was backed by the U.S., and he had kind of a kind of family dynasty that ruled the country since the 1930s. So in the 1980s, the Reagan administration, the CIA, support these Contras, and they carry out terror attacks on civilian targets. One of the co-founders and leaders of the Contras later, he defected and he wrote an article in the New York Times in which he admitted that they use terrorism systematically as a weapon. He admitted that they, he famously wrote, we burn down schools and hospitals faster than the Sandinistas can build them. And anyway, the point is, is that the U.S. also directly participated. Not only did the CIA support the Contras, but the CIA also, for instance, put mines in Nicaragua's civilian port, which obviously destroyed civilian ships and prevented trade, making it very difficult for Nicaragua to import products, which also fueled an inflation crisis. It was put under a blockade by the U.S. So in the 1980s, the Nicaraguan government took the U.S. to the Hague, the International Court of Justice. This is the maximum UN legal authority. And Nicaragua won the case actually in 1986. And the Hague said that the US owes Nicaragua reparations and that it carried out war crimes in these attacks on Nicaragua. However, it was never implemented because in order for an ICJ ruling to have teeth, it has to be passed by the Security Council, which is the only UN body that actually has the ability to use force. And there's a big problem. When the United Nations was created after World War II, the U.S. and the victors of World War II set it up in a way so the five victors have permanent seats on the Security Council, which gives them veto power. And that is the U.S., the U.K., France, Russia, and China. And that means that the U.S., which has used its veto power more than all of the other countries, although, you know, sometimes Russia has as well, but the U.S. is leading in using its veto in recent decades. And the U.S. used its veto power in order to prevent the ICJ ruling from being implemented. So still today, every year, the Nicaraguan government, ha their government releases a press release calling on the government, reminding them of this 1986 ruling and say that they still owe reparations legally. Isn't that unbelievable that, uh, so uh, by historical context, is it fair to assume that the outcome of the ICJ verdict in regards to Israel's genocide might also not have any teeth 
Well, absolutely. I mean, there are a few things to unpack here. So the ICJ has not officially ruled on the charges. What it has ruled on is that the charges are legitimate and Israel can be investigated. So, of course, these ICJ cases take several years. In the case of the Nicaraguan case, it took three years. So now with these charges that South Africa has formally introduced, that was in that was at the end of December of 2023. And then the court had a little over a month in which they deliberated and they decided that, yes, the charges are legitimate and Israel can be investigated on accusations of genocide. That means that the case is now probably going to take, who knows, two or three, even longer, two or three years, maybe longer. However, there are several important aspects of this ruling. One, not only did the ICJ rule that the charges are legitimate, that there's sufficient evidence to investigate Israel on charges of genocide, specifically of violating the UN Genocide Convention. But furthermore, the UN also stated very clearly in its ruling, which you can find online, that, that is the ICJ, which is the top UN legal body. They also stated that Israel has to stop killing Palestinians as soon as possible. And South Africa, actually, today is the 4th of February. And um, on the 2nd, South Africa's foreign ministry published a statement formally accusing Israel of violating the ruling that has already been done by the ICJ, because since the ruling, Israel has already killed more than 1,100 more Palestinians. So now over 27,000 Palestinians, which is probably a very conservative estimate. So there are a few different things to consider. There's that aspect. And there's also the aspect that Benjamin Netanyahu, the very far right prime minister of Israel, who just keeps coming back again and again, despite the fact that he loses elections, he finds a way to like manipulate the elections and, and have he's held five elections recently just because he keeps losing and doesn't get enough votes to have a majority. So he gave a speech in which Netanyahu said, no one will stop us, not even the Hague. You can find that. He actually tweeted it as well. Nobody will stop us, not even the Hague is the quote. And furthermore, so Israel has stated that it will not abide by any ruling. And if there were a ruling that was, I mean, they already have this ruling, but after two years, and if the ICJ comes to the final ruling, then it still has to go through the Security Council. And given that since October, the U.S. has already vetoed three different Security Council resolutions calling for ceasefires in Gaza. It's very likely that the U.S. would do the same. Uh, now, and of course, you have Ben Gavir saying Hague Schmeg and, and just a horrible thing to have to read on, on Twitter. Um, what, what else can we expect as far as, um, you know, obviously 60 percent of Democratic voters are for a ceasefire and think that, you know, there's something something wrong uh, with with Israel. Are, is this reeking of desperation on behalf of Western powers? Is the power shifting so much that uh, we're just seeing this genocide in real time and we have no no ability to stop it? Is is American power and influence and Israel as well? Are they under threat? I mean, is, are this empire going to crumble? I guess is my question. Yeah. Well. I I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but we're definitely seeing a rapid decline in U.S. hegemony, and especially in this region. And of course, it goes without saying, but just to emphasize, this is one of the most strategic regions of the world. You know, the Middle East, or a better term people are using now is West Asia, because, you know, Middle East, it's like compared, middle compared to what? Compared to Europe, right? It's West Asia. And in this region, of course, you have five of the top 10 oil producers on earth and also half of the world's top gas producers concentrated of course in the persian gulf region and now what we've seen is in the past 20 years with the economic rise of china china has become the world's largest oil importer and china is also the largest trading partner of most of the countries in the region not only iran but also historic u.s allies like saudi arabia and the united arab emirates so there's that geopolitical shift. There's another huge shift, which is not talked about enough, which is, I think, one of the most important shifts in the past 20 years, which is that the U.S. has gone from being the world's largest importer of oil to the world's largest producer of oil. And that was largely because of um, three main factors. One, after the 2008 financial crash, 
the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank, dropped interest rates to basically zero, and they had this quantitative easing program, which means that there was all this liquidity going around to fund new investment, and some of that went into expanded oil production and oil exploration. Two, the the shale production, which is very important. So as oil price, prices rose, it became more profitable to do new oil drilling for shale. And that meant that the US became the world's largest oil producer. And then finally, the other factor is uh, OPEC has basically been expanded. OPEC is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It was created in the 1970s. Uh, as you know, a group of oil producing nations, largely in the global south, and they used that oil, their their oil power as a geopolitical tool in the 1970s, actually in, involving Israel. In response to the 1973 Yom Kippur War, o OPEC tried to launch an oil embargo of the West in support of the Palestinians. Well, what's happened is that OPEC was basically kind of neutered in recent decades, especially with the U.S. rising as a significant oil producer. But now, since about 2014, Russia has basically joined OPEC. It's now called OPEC Plus. It's a de facto member. And that means that Saudi Arabia and Russia are working basically together when it comes to international oil prices. So we've seen that Biden has been repeatedly trying to pressure Saudi Arabia to increase its oil production in order to drop oil prices, which would drop inflation because the rising energy prices have been one of the biggest contributors to consumer price inflation. However, Saudi Arabia said no. And in fact, Russia and Saudi actually decreased oil production to try to increase oil prices. So we've seen this confluence of factors involving oil and gas. But furthermore, again, the fact that China has become the largest trading partner of the region, that means that many countries in the region are no longer looking at the US as their most important ally. They're looking eastward. And this means that the U.S. actually is losing many of its allies in the region. The Iraq war was a failure. The Afghanistan war was a failure. The U.S. is being pushed out of Syria. And we now see that today, again, is February 4th. The Biden administration just launched airstrikes on Iraq and Syria, hitting 85 targets. And they've repeatedly attacked Iraq and Syria because there are attacks on the U.S. soldiers in Iraq and Syria who are there illegally. The governments of Iraq and Syria have called for the U.S. troops to leave. So all of these factors are coming together, and the U.S. is being pushed out of this region, which is, it, it has really, really had hegemonic control over since the end of the British Empire, right? Really since, you could say, the 1950s and the Suez Canal crisis, the, the British Empire significantly declined, and the U.S. kind of took its place. And we now see it being pushed out. So Israel is really the last key U.S. ally remaining. Even close U.S. allies like Saudi Arabia and Egypt are now looking more eastward. And they both, as of January, they both are now part of the BRICS with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So this is, I think, this really explains why the U.S. is so strongly supporting Israel. Because, you know, there's this famous joke that people say in Washington, this famous quote which is that Israel is an unsinkable aircraft carrier for the U.S. military. Hmm. That is so strange. And, and at the same time, you know, deindustrialization has hurt the United States quite a bit, too. I mean, we've moved from an industrial uh, country to that produces things to, you know, subcontracting out this uh, to obviously China, which you just wrote an article saying that they become has become the world's sole manufacturing power. Um, Superpower. What else has played in superpower? What else has played so, so, into this? Sole manufacturing superpower. There are still other manufacturing powers, but there's only one manufacturing superpower. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, who ranks uh, close second to that? Yeah, well, this is according to a, a research paper that was published by an economist in Switzerland, Richard Baldwin. And he published a research paper at a, Euro a very influential European think tank called the Center for economic policy research. And his research shows that China is now responsible for 35% of world manufacturing gross output. That means that China is China makes up more global manufacturing than the next nine largest manufacturers combined, which other significant manufacturing powers still include the US, Germany, France, uh, Japan is a major industrial power, South Korea, 
but you combine all of them together and China produces more. And one of the significant reasons for that is, as you mentioned, because of deindustrialization and outsourcing. But it's not just that, it's also because China has implemented a very ambitious industrial policy in which the state has provided many, uh, you know, um, state control of certain strategic industries to reduce the cost of production. And also state-owned banks have given very favorable loans at low interest rates to encourage the creation of these, this manufacturing sector. And we now see this, especially in the green industries, which are becoming, you know, the most important industries of the future. And we now see that China is leading the world in what they call the big three of green technology, in batteries, in electric vehicles, and in solar and wind power. China is by far r- responsible for the, the majority of world production. In 2023, China actually installed more solar panel capacity than the entire world combined. And in just three years, due to this, this state-backed industrial policy, China has gone from exporting almost no cars to now being the world's top car exporter because it's largely exporting a lot of electric vehicles. And now the world's largest electric vehicle manufacturer is not Elon Musk's Tesla. It's actually the Chinese company BYD. So we see, again, we were talking about the shifts in in West Asia, but now what we're also seeing is massive shifts in global manufacturing and in particular in these key green industries. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. And going back to the hegemony of the United States, obviously, um, we tried for a long time with real politic and sort of manipulative uh, imperialist policies that we were trying to splinter pan Arabism. Do you think the chickens are coming home to roost with that now? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's a funny story because you go back and you look and the at some moments the U.S. was trying to uh, recruit pan Arabism against communism. But then eventually the U.S. just opposed both Pan-Arabism, Pan-Arabism and communism. And especially starting really in the 1970s, going into the 1980s, the U.S. really leaned in, ironically, into Islamism, which is not talked, a lot of, talked about a lot. But, you know, we, in the 1990s and 2000s, we obviously saw an increase in many of these extremist Islamist groups. They didn't come from nowhere, right? They, that was actually U.S. policy and also Israeli policy of encouraging these Islamist groups as an alternative to secular Arab nationalism and also to communism. And we saw, for instance, that in the 1980s, you know, the Soviet Union had this war in Afghanistan in which they were supporting the Afghan socialist government. But what, what happened is the U.S. began supporting the famous Mujahideen, who were Islamist extremists, right? And you can find these famous photos of Ronald Reagan in the White House meeting with leaders of the Afghan Mujahideen, also the British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, the godmother of neoliberalism from the Conservative Party. She, she also went to these refugee camps and, for Afghan refugees, and she praised the, Mujahid, the Mujahideen, these Islamist extremists, as freedom fighters and said anyone who opposes them is you know, supporting godless communism. So there's this history of the West supporting these very right-wing Islamist forces in the region to counter Arab nationalism and communism. And now here we are after decades of, of extreme conflicts, like the war in Syria, which I think a lot of people have forgotten about, but that's, the war in Syria is what gave birth to ISIS, right? It didn't come out of nowhere. It was a mixture of the U.S. war in Iraq, where Al-Qaeda in Iraq was, you know, cultivated essentially through the U.S. occupation of Iraq, and it got a little bit of legitimacy among some elements of Iraq. And then after the, well, the Iraq war never really ended, but it kind of officially ended, but it still continues. The U.S. still has troops there and is still regularly bombing Iraq. But then it was the war in Syria, in which the U.S. again supported many of these Islamist groups, the so-called moderate rebels, to fight against the Syrian government. And then that led to Al-Qaeda in Iraq moving into Syria and then calling itself ISIS, and that's Islamic State of Iraq and Asham, which is the Levant region. So they were expanding throughout the region. So, I mean, obviously, U.S. policy in this region has been a complete disaster, and it's a continuation largely of British imperial policy in the region. And it's been a complete disaster for so many decades. So it's no surprise that many of the countries, even longtime allies, not even for necessarily ideological reasons, but simply out of political stability and economic opportunities, 
they're now looking more toward the east. And, and that's why I think China also looks like a much more attractive partner for many of these countries, because China also doesn't intervene in their internal politics and support a lot of these groups and, you know, impose sanctions if they do something that they don't like. So again, I think we are seeing these massive shifts and a lot of it is because it's backlash from U.S. policies, just as U.S. deindustrialization and outsourcing led to, you know, helped help ironically to fuel the rise of China as an industrial power. The U.S. very aggressive interventionist policies in the region have come back to, to bite pretty hard. Is it fair to say that the United States policies have been sort of overly aggressive and are the BRICS countries that are coming together now, are they working together more diplomatically? Do they have a, like a new idea about how to work together without, you know, coups and bloodshed and stuff like this? Well, I don't know how anyone with a straight face can claim that the U.S. policy in the region has not been aggressive. I mean, just think about in our lifetimes, two wars on Iraq the Gulf War 1990-1991 and the invasion of Iraq in 2003, following sanctions on Iraq that according to the top United Nations humanita humanitarian coordinator in Iraq, Dennis Halliday, he called them genocidal. He resigned in protest. Again, this is the top UN official overseeing humanitarian policy in Iraq. He said that the US-led sanctions on Iraq were genocidal. So that was just Iraq. Then you have the war on Syria, the war on Libya, Libya was the most prosperous country in Africa. Now it's become you know, a failed state with an ongoing civil war since 2011, since NATO bombed and destroyed the Libyan government and killed the Libyan leader, Muammar Gaddafi. Then you also have the war in Yemen, which has been going on for, for well over 10 years now. It, it didn't even start with the Saudi bombing in 2015 that was backed by the US, but it even goes back to after 9-11 when the U.S. began launching a lot of drone strikes on Yemen, as the journalist Jeremy Scahill showed in his book, Dirty Wars. I mean, Yemen has been a target of the U.S. war on terror for many years. So you have Yemen, Iraq, Syria. You now also have this horrific conflict in Gaza, which is not the first time. I mean, Israel, every few years, launches a war in Gaza. They call it mowing the lawn with this very genocidal rhetoric in 2008 to 2009, in 2014, in 2022. So. I mean, you can look at basically every country in the region has been destabilized by these conflicts. Now, as for your question about BRICS, I think we should understand that first and foremost, BRICS is economic. It's an economic organization, partnership. I wouldn't necessarily call it an alliance because China and India have very complex relations, very antagonistic relations in some sense, but in, in terms of politics and diplomacy, but in terms of economics, they do share a lot in common because they're both countries, developing countries in the global south. And BRICS fundamentally brought together these developing economies that wanted to create new alternatives, alternative economic infrastructure, trade opportunities, finance opportunities. And the reason that they're even called BRICS is originally BRIC. And that, that's because in the 2000s, they were referred to as the major developing economies. Brazil, Russia, India, and China, they were the fastest growing developing economies. And then South Africa joined in 2009, and now they're expanding. But the point is, is that what are the main projects of BRICS? They're not really political in, in the sense of, I mean, they are political in the sense that economics is always political, but they're not political in the sense of diplomacy necessarily. They're political, they're economic in the sense that fundamentally, the main goal of BRICS is de-dollarization. And we see that now the BRICS members are all trading with each other in their local currencies. Brazil and China signed an agreement last year to trade in their respective currencies, the Brazilian real and the Chinese renminbi or yuan. Russia and India have completely de-dollarized their trade. They now trade basically entirely in their local currencies, the Russian ruble and the, and the Chinese yuan. Also Russia and India in their currencies. And actually, it's become now known as the BRICS five R's because ironically, people didn't think about this, but all of the currencies of the founding BRICS members, the original five are start with R, the Russian ruble, the Indian rupee, the Chinese renminbi, the South African rand and the, the Brazilian real. So um, another part of BRICS that's important, that's also expanding is the New Development Bank. It was previously known as the BRICS Bank. Now 
it's called the New Development Bank, which again shows what they really want to try to do. They want to fund development. And the New Development Bank has expanded with numerous new members, including Egypt and Uruguay and Latin America, and also Bangladesh and the United Arab Emirates. And BRICS now has expanded, and there are five new members, which are uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. So now together, the BRICS countries represent more than 40% of world oil production. So again, fundamentally, this is an economic grouping, an economic bloc. And what they're really trying to do is, cre is trying to democratize the existing international economic institutions, which are largely dominated by the U.S., and they're all based on the U.S. dollar, like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. But at the same time, they have a, an, what you can call an in and out strategy. So in the existing institutions, try to democratize them to the extent they can. And also the out strategy is simply creating new institutions. And fundamentally, hmm. the goal is de-dollarization. Hmm. And I, you know, I hope they achieve it. Well, let's go back to my favorite topic, which is the waning hegemony of the United States. Um, can you take me a little bit through ECOWAS and sort of the coups that have been happening in Africa over the last, you know, 10 years or so, and what that represents for, you know, the power shift globally? Yeah, well, we, we can call them coups, but I think it's also, in some ways, you could just call them up uprisings. The thing about the, these many of these um, unfortunately very underdeveloped countries in largely in Western Africa is that the governments are not obviously democratic. So yes, you could say you, just because when we talk about coups, almost always coups are very reactionary. They're often led by you know right wing oligarch interests. There are a few examples of these kind of military overthrows in West Africa where they're actually very progressive. And actually, this goes back to the 1980s. And there was a, a, a leftist military takeover. Actually, you can go back even further. We were talking about you know, West Asia, the Arab majority countries. There actually were several progressive military takeovers in countries like Iraq. This is before Saddam. There was a, a leftist military leader in Iraq, um, in, in other countries in the region. Obviously, Nasser in Egypt. You could say it was a technically, a, you could call it a military coup, but it was really a kind of progressive military takeover that became a revolution led by. The, 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 you know, revolutionary left-wing Arab nationalist Nasser. Um, but anyway, getting back to West Africa, we, in 1980s, there was a progressive military takeover by um, Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso. And he, he was a Marxist and he was also a feminist and he emphasized the importance of women and women's empowerment. He was also a very early environmentalist and did a lot of, um, you know, environmentally sustainable projects of planting trees. And, and um, he did a lot of poverty reduction programs and fighting against illiteracy and fighting against poverty and supporting public health care. Um, Tomas Sankara was overthrown in, a, in another coup. So that's why he's, you know, he's a very complicated. He was overthrown in a coup led by his former ally who, who became a traitor and became very right wing. His name was uh, Blaise Campaoré and became a very close U.S. ally, a neoliberal, who implemented mass privatization. So there's a history of this happening in West Africa. And what we've seen in the past few years is three military takeovers led by relatively progressive governments in, um, in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. And in the case of Burkina Faso, there's a very young military leader who, when he took, when he took over, he was 35 years old. Um, and his name is Ibrahim um, Traoré, and Traoré is directly drawing from the historical legacy of this socialist military leader in the 80s, Thomas Sankara. And in fact, Ibrahim Traoré, whenever he gives a speech, he often quotes um, Che Guevara, the, of course, the famous Argentine slash Cuban revolutionary. And furthermore, in Burkina Faso, Traoré has appointed as his prime minister a an older revolutionary who is from the communist movement who was an ally of Thomas Sankara in the 1980s. So there's this history that's being brought back and it's pretty easy to explain why there are, these countries are re rebelling and it's because of neocolonialism. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but in many parts of West Africa, the countries do not have control over their own currency. 
Their currency is controlled by France through a system that's called the CFA franc. Now, France doesn't even use the franc anymore. France uses the euro, right? But these Western, West African countries use the CFA franc, which was originally named the colonial franc. It was colonial France Afrique, like French Africa, and they renamed it. But this is, this is a, a currency that is directly rooted in the history of French colonialism in Africa. And, and the, these countries in West Africa, until recently, they had to hold half of their foreign exchange reserves of their central banks in Paris. And that was controlled by France. And if they wanted to access their foreign exchange reserves, they had to get approval from France. So these countries are largely rebelling against France's influence over them. And this kind of neo-colonial relationship where you look at these countries, I mentioned, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, look at their economic model. The vast majority of their income, their, their the national income and GDP comes from exports of raw materials, in particular gold. They're huge exporters of gold. Every year they export tens of billions of dollars worth of gold, and yet they're among the poorest countries on earth. Furthermore, Niger is one of the world's leading exporters of uranium. And actually France, which still has a very big nuclear power, nuclear energy sector, France has historically relied on importing uranium from Niger. So these countries are exporting one of the most v valuable commodities on earth, gold, and yet are still extremely poor. The vast majority of the population is poor. And there's, there's a, a common statistic that Oxfam um, published, the International Anti-Poverty Organization, that in Niger, about two-thirds of the population does not have electricity still, and yet w w one th out of every three light bulbs in France is powered in part because of the nuclear power thanks to Niger Nigerian uranium. uranium. So this is why these countries have rebelled against these kinds of neocolonial policies and kicked out the French soldiers. And also now they're calling for the U.S. soldiers to leave as well. And they're trying to exercise more sovereignty and try to implement new economic policies and development so they can finally lift themselves out of this brutal poverty. So uh, obviously the, there is some uh, question that the world is becoming a multipolar sort of imperialist uh, world, but I don't fully buy it. But the idea that Russia comes down with the Wagner Group and gives out uh, grain to, to African countries right now and have actually said that we're going to help build nuclear power plants in Africa. What has stopped the United States or France or any other Western country from coming in and doing that? I mean, they've pretty much had the run of the show for so long. Why haven't Western powers built a nuclear power plant? That's exactly right. It's a good question. I mean, sometimes people throw around the imperialism word just, just too, too vaguely. You need to be much more specific. I mean, when you look at what the European powers did to Africa, first of all, they committed genocide. And we now see this with Nam Namibia, which has supported the South African case against Israel, accusing Israel of genocide. Namibia has also publicly condemned Germany. Because well before Nazism, in between 1904 and 1908, Germany committed genocide in Namibia, and Namibia has, has still demanded reparations, and the German government has, you know, they vaguely, they, in, a, in a small way, they apologize, but they haven't really done anything. So the point is, is that the European powers, I mean, France, they committed genocide. Look at what France did in Algeria. Brutal, brutal conflict. And there's a amazing film that everyone should watch, The Battle for Algiers, right? But um, just throwing around the imperialism where it's absurd, just because a country has a foreign policy and carries out activities outside of its borders does not make it imperialist. And in, in, in fact, in West Africa, Russia is rather popular, largely because they see Russia simply as standing up against the West. And in fact, many of these countries have asked for Russian military support because they're fighting against many of these extremist groups, which historically have been empowered by these Western interventionist policies we were talking about. And in the case of France and the US, they, they say, you know, Russia allegedly has these fighters from Wagner or whatever in West Africa. And in some cases, they were actually invited by the, the West African governments. But we should ask ourselves, wait, so the U.S. and France have had troops in these countries for decades. Why have they not been able to defeat these extremist groups, right? I mean, so 
if, if they're if the U.S. and France are supposedly protecting all these countries, why do these countries n- not want the France and the in the U.S. there? And then also, when you look at Russia's trade, you mentioned wheat. If you actually look at many of these trade agreements, they're very favorable. Russia uses people say, well, you know, Russia is doing this for geopolitical reasons. Okay, it's not a crime for a country to use its its natural resources and trade for geopolitical reasons. So. So Russia does give very favorable uh, uh, trade arrangements to many of these poor countries and gives them wheat at below market value. And then they say, well, thank you for the support. And of course, Russia is doing this, of course, to try to win political support. But obviously that works in Africa. I mean, if you give people food, then they're probably going to support you. That's that's how politics works. And this is also what's been happening in India. Soft power over hard power every time. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, this, that. Is, this is exactly what's <laughs> happening in India and even with Pakistan. So with the war in Ukraine, the West imposed these sanctions on Russia and waged an economic war against Russia. Biden said his goal was to make the ruble into rubble, which is a crazy statement because, I mean, regardless of what people think about Putin and the Russian leadership, everyone in Russia, unless they're very wealthy, they, they get paid in rubles. They have their wealth in rubles. So if your goal is to crash the currency, your goal is to bankrupt the vast majority of people in Russia. Only the oligarchs have their wealth stored in dollars on offshore bank accounts, right? So yeah. the U.S. has waged economic war against Russia. And then the U.S. has been pressuring other countries not to trade with Russia. So what's happening is that Russia has been selling its oil below market value at very favorable rates to countries like India. And then the U.S. tells India, don't buy that very cheap oil from Russia. But they're not going to sell India that cheap oil. They're just saying, don't buy the cheap oil. This is also what happened in Pakistan. <laughs> and the U.S. pressured Imran Khan not to sign a deal in which Imran Khan, the, the ele- elected prime minister of Pakistan, was buying very low-cost wheat and oil from Russia. And then the U.S. backed this political coup against him. And now... There's a, an unelected military coup regime that runs Pakistan, and they have imprisoned Imran Khan on fake charges. They're trying to imprison him for decades. So, and and the, the U.S. tells Pakistan, don't buy oil and wheat from Russia. So what happens in Pakistan? They have an inflation crisis because energy costs have been skyrocketing and food costs have been skyrocketing, and they have no foreign exchange reserves. They have no dollars they need to pay for their imports. So you've had inflation rates of like, 50%. So, I mean, if you're going to tell yeah. these countries in the global south to stop trading with China and Russia, you have to offer them something. And if you don't offer them something, they're going to trade. That's that's how this works. And as you said, soft power trumps hard power, but the US is so used to this policy, it used to be re- called it used to be referred to as um speak softly or or uh speak softly and carry a big stick, right? I mean, this is exactly what the U.S. does. Like, they threaten everyone with the stick, and then when people take the carrots, they complain. Hmm. Now, as far as uh, uh, United States exports and 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 are, do we have any leg to stand on in the United States as far as what we all can offer the world, other than just military bullying? No, I mean, there could potentially be the possibility, <laughs> potentially, but realistically, where is it? I mean, I mentioned this report yeah. earlier. This is by a, a European economist, Richard Baldwin, who teaches in Switzerland. He mentioned in his own report, this is a research paper, he said, the U.S. is the world's sole military superpower. The U.S. spends more in its military than the next 10 largest military spenders combined. China is the world's industrial superpower, the U- uh, China produces more than the next nine largest countries combined. So it, that, there's this, this phrase people say, the U.S. bombs while China builds. And it, that's true. I mean, that's why so many countries, over 100 countries have joined China's international initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative. And it's very easy to explain why. China is telling people, all right, we're going to help you build roads and ports and hospitals, and schools. And why? Well, it's because people say, 
again, they throw around the I word, which is absurd, Chinese imperialism. It's the opposite of imperialism. China understands that they have this idea of win-win development. They, 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 they oppose what they refer to as Washington's zero-sum game mentality. And they say, we can, we can have win-win. Yes, we're going to help you build this. We're not going to do it for free. We're going to give you loans and we're going to build it. And then what happens? You become one of our main trading partners. So you economically grow because one of the most important ways to grow a developing economy is through infrastructure, right? Because if you're going to expand your production and you're going to export, you need the infrastructure, you need the roads, you need the railroads, you need the ports in order to do that. And then you can trade more as you grow economically and they're trading more with China. So it's mutually beneficial. Whereas the US has said, okay, well, if you want to do all of this stuff, if you want to fund education and healthcare and infrastructure, you're a communist. You're, you're going to try to nationalize the foreign multinational corporations based in the US that own that. So we're going to overthrow you and we're going to prevent you from carrying out these policies. And we're not going to help you develop economically. And okay, you're not going to trade with us, but whatever, we're at least going to get very cheap natural resources from you. I mean, in, in Latin America, this is the history. Every time you have one of these kind of developmentalist leaders, almost all of whom were not communists, by the way, most of them were just kind of left wing leaders, nationalists, some of them, some of them were socialists. And the US overthrows them, and then puts in these leaders like we see now at Javier Millet in Argentina, who's just destroying the entire economy. So again, it's not a surprise why these countries are looking largely to China. I mean, Russia doesn't necessarily offer an alternative model. Russia is popular in some countries in the global south simply because it's standing up to the West. They see Russia as a country that is, you know, fighting back and they respect that about Russia. But it doesn't have an alternative economic model that it's proposing. China does. Mm -hmm. And that's why, I mean, I do a lot of research on the Belt and Road Initiative. And the West really does not understand the, the historic shifts that we're seeing. Africa is the fastest growing continent economically and in terms of population. And we hear all these, this discussion of declining birth rates in many other parts of the world. Well, in Africa, it's, birth rates are still very high. You have countries like Nigeria, Ethiopia, South Africa, they're growing very quickly. And economically, you know, by 2050, they're going to become very important in international trade. And you know who they're going to trade with? It's going to be China. And, and maybe to a lesser extent, maybe Europe and a lot of other countries in Asia, Indonesia, India, Japan. So, I mean, the US keeps acting like we're living in the 20th century. We're not living in the 20th century. We're living in a very different time. You mentioned the world multipolarity. We're living in a very multipolar world. And the US really, if they're actually serious about this idea they call competition with China, then they really, sh they need to provide the carrots and not just the sticks. And we do hear th these claims that the U.S. is going to create an alternative to Belt and Road. But again, they, they always announce these things and they never actually do it. And, and I often say to people that the U.S. is very, very good at marketing. China is very bad at marketing. China does all of these things and most people don't even know about them outside of China. The U.S., says they're going to do all this stuff. They don't do any of it. So maybe the US should do less marketing and actually try to put its money where its mouth is and help to develop these infrastructure projects. And then they could actually compete as they say they want, want to with China. Yeah, I think it's fascinating too that, uh, you know, uh, politics in America is falling apart and, and we, we look you know, there's this reputation Russia has for even being uh, poor, but in reality, uh, China, Vietnam, Russia, a lot of these countries that have this reputation have lifted themselves way out of poverty in the last since, you know, since I've been alive. Um, what about, you know, obviously this is a big point of contention and misinformation about what's going on in Venezuela. What's the Ben Norton take on Venezuela? The, the most important reason for the economic crisis in Venezuela was the U.S. economic war and the sanctions, period. I mean, the Venezuelan government did commit some errors, which we can talk about, but the most important reason the, that if you cannot understand anything without understanding the fact that Venezuela for 100 years has been a petro state, 
that has relied on exporting its oil. The U.S. put very heavy sanctions on Venezuela, leading to an economic embargo that prevented Venezuela from producing and exporting its oil, which the government relied on, and it faced a severe economic crisis. It's not because of socialism and all of that. In fact, in Venezuela, the vast majority of the economy has always remained private. But you know, they they did have a very progressive government that launched the Bolivarian Revolution that nationalized the oil industry in particular, which was very important. So Venezuela faces the economic problems that many resource rich countries have faced that ec economists often refer to as Dutch disease or the resource curse, right? There's this idea that having a lot of natural resources is something very good because your country can become wealthy. Well, yes and no. It can also be a curse because what happens is that a country that has a lot of natural resources often simply exports those natural resources and lives off the rent of the, the exports, but does not actually develop other industries. This is a problem that we've seen in many countries, Saudi Arabia as being the clear example, right? Where, you know, in Saudi Arabia, the vast majority of the population is, does not even have citizenship. The majority of the population consists of migrant workers largely from South Asia, Southeast Asia, who are treated horribly, basically like slaves. This is the same model in the UAE, in Qatar, in Bahrain. So you have a small elite, the, like five to 10% of the population actually has citizenship and they benefit from the natural resources, but the country basically relies on exploiting this foreign labor that's paid very low. Now, if you look in Venezuela, so Venezuela has been a petrostate for 100 years before Hugo Chavez, the revolutionary, was born. And then what happened is, for most of its history, that oil did not benefit the majority of the population. That oil benefited a small handful of elites, like in Saudi Arabia. And you can read, it's just disgusting. I spent a lot of time in Venezuela. And you can read the, the books written by some of the former elites, um, like Vanessa Neumann, who was uh, the uh, one uh, a daughter of one of the wealthiest Venezuelan oligarchs, and she was involved in this coup attempt with Juan Guaido, where the U.S. tried to appoint this this fake president, Juan Guaido, who never participated in a presidential election. The the Trump administration appointed him as the fake president of Venezuela and tried to pressure other countries to recognize him. Well, one of his so-called ambassadors to the U.K. was Vanessa Neumann from the, one of the w wealthiest families in the country, and she wrote a book in which she literally makes fun of, of people in the U.S. for being poor compared to her lifestyle growing up before the Bolivarian Revolution. And she said that we were so rich that we would fly to Miami in the morning and go shopping and spend thousands of dollars and then fly back to Venezuela at night. She, she, she boasted about this in her book. So that's how Venezuela was until the Bolivarian Revolution. And then Hugo Chavez, who was also, speaking of left-wing military officers, he was a military officer from a very poor background, and he was influenced by the history of the left-wing movements in Latin America and also by liberation theology. And he, he originally tried a military coup against a brutal right-wing leader, Carlos Andres Perez, who carried out a massacre. There, there were protests against his neoliberal policies that were backed by the IMF, you know, the Washington Consensus policies. And, and he Carlos Andres Perez, this U.S.-backed right-wing Venezuelan leader, he ordered a massacre of Venezuelan protesters. Thousands of civilians were killed and injured in what was known as the Caracaso. And some military officers, they were radicalized by this experience and they became revolutionaries. And Hugo Chavez tried to overthrow him and have a left-wing military takeover, and he failed. And then Chavez was imprisoned. And then he became such a popular figure in popular Venezuelan consciousness in the 90s that he was pardoned and then he ran for president in 1998 and he won the election fair and square in 1999. And then Hugo Chavez launched the Bolivarian Revolution named after Simon Bolivar, the leftist, um, the, the anti-colonial leader who fought against Spanish colonialism. And in the, in the 18th and, and early 19th century, and Bolivar helped create the modern countries of Venezuela, Colombia, Bolivia. That's why Bolivia is named after him, right? Ecuador. So anyway, so Chavez went back to this history of Bol Bolivar. He created the Bolivarian Revolution and he nationalized the oil industry. 
that historically had been used to benefit the elites. Instead, he used that oil revenue to fund social programs. He, the Venezuelan government has built more than 5 million housing units for poor and working people that they provide at very low cost. I've seen some of the housing. I mean, it's, you know, they're apartments. They're not like super luxury housing, but they're like, they're better than many of the apartments I lived in in New York, right? I mean, they're solid quality apartments that they provide to poor people. They funded healthcare and education. So really they use that oil wealth to benefit the population. However, the U.S., they, they always faced, Chavez and his successor Maduro, they always faced a fundamental problem. The economy has always been heavily reliant on oil and it did not have many other industries. They tried to diversify, but it's very difficult to convince people, for instance, to go out and live in the countryside to grow food because Venezuela historically imported the majority of its food. So as recently as 2019, when the US launched this coup with Juan Guaido and all of that, Venezuela was still importing about half of its food from other countries. So then the US put all these sanctions on Venezuela, it could no longer export its oil, and it could no longer import not only things like food, but also it couldn't import the machine parts and the capital goods it needed to fix the equipment and that it needed to export the oil, right? I mean, obviously, oil doesn't just magically come out of the ground. You have to drill it. And when you're drilling it, you have to use these, this technology that needs to be kept up, right? If it breaks, you have to repair it. Well, if you can't import that technology because it was all made by U.S. companies, because even though Chavez nationalized the oil industry, it was using technology that over many decades had been built by U.S. companies, right? They didn't have a, a significant technology sector. So with the sanctions, it became very difficult to keep up all of the oil production. It started declining. Then we talked about earlier the U.S. shale boom, which also collapsed oil prices. There was also the end of the commodity super cycle that hit many countries in Latin America. There was this congruence of many different factors. And then the sanctions just made it, they, they collapsed Venezuela's oil sector. And if you go to the U.S., the U.S. Um, Energy Information Administration website, the EIA, they boasted about this in the Trump administration. They posted a, a graph and they say something like, this was in 2019, and it says, you know, oil production in Venezuela has fallen to its lowest levels in modern history. And th they're basically boasting that that was because of the sanctions. And you can see every, you, I have a graph that I often show in my reports. It shows that every time the U.S. imposed sanctions, Oil production decline, 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 decline. Hmm. So people say, you know, it's socialism, blah, blah, blah. People who say that know nothing about Venezuela. And again, this is, this is not a problem of socialism. But this is a problem that many oil exporting countries have faced. And can you imagine what would happen to Saudi Arabia's economy if the U.S. put sanctions on Saudi Arabia and said that it cannot export oil? It, it would probably face an even worse economic crisis. Yeah. And at this point, I don't think it's possible because Saudi Arabia is sort of drifting away from that anyway. And they, you, like you said before, China is a, a great customer for them. Um, but yeah, wasn't well, there some... one other quick note, one yeah. quick note on this. Venezuela was kind of like the canary in the coal mine. So, you know, this de-dollarization initiative, it's not new. In fact, this goes back decades. But um, famously in Iraq, Saddam Hussein actually was selling his oil in euro. And this was in, in, in the 2000s, the euro was still new and people thought that the euro could challenge the dollar and obviously it didn't happen. But de-dollarization has been a project for many years. Muammar Gaddafi in Libya also wanted to create a gold-backed pan-African currency and sell his oil in, in gold and euros and other currencies. Well, but anyway, the point is Venezuela for a decade now for over a decade has been trying to sell its oil in other currencies and actually has. Venezuela has sold its oil in rubles and in Chinese yuan. And also it's bartered its oil for other countries. And um, so recently we saw a massive increase in interest in de-dollarization. And that's because in 2022, over the war in Ukraine, the West, not only did they put sanctions on Russia, but they froze $300 billion of the Russian central bank's foreign exchange reserves that were largely held in Western banks. Now, this was a huge wake-up call because 
people around the world, central banks around the world were saying, if the, the West can freeze, that is essentially steal Russia's central bank foreign exchange reserves, they could easily do it to us. Anything we hold in dollars, you don't physically hold the dollars. The dollars are not like, the vast majority of dollars in the world are not paper. The vast majority are simply dollars that are digital. They're, they're decimals on a computer screen, right? And so what happened is the, the West froze Russia's central bank reserves. Well, that was not the first time. First, the U.S. froze Iran's central bank reserves. But people were like, well, you know, Iran, that's a special case. They're not going to do the same thing to us. Then the U.S. froze Afghanistan's central bank reserves. Then the U.S. froze Venezuela's central bank reserves. And more and more countries are saying, wow, well, actually, originally it was just Iran. Then it was Afghanistan. Now it's Venezuela. And still today, there are billions of dollars of Venezuela's foreign exchange reserves that it cannot get access to, including billion, over a billion dollars, nearly $2 billion worth of gold that the British Central Bank, the Bank of England, has refused to give back. And then finally, Russia. And that was like the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And now, even longtime allies, I mentioned Saudi Arabia, even Saudi Arabia is now de-dollarizing because they're afraid that, that the U.S. did it to Iran, to, to, um, to Afghanistan, to Venezuela, to Russia. We could easily be next. If the U.S. decides we no longer like the government, we're going to freeze your foreign exchange reserves. And now mm. one of the most insane things that the West is doing is they're openly, publicly talking about using the foreign exchange reserves they stole from Russia in order to pay for reconstruction in Ukraine and to buy military equipment for Ukraine. You can see this in the New York Times. So, so countries like Egypt and the UAE and Saudi Arabia, historic US allies are being like, wow, uh, we should try to de-dollarize because the US could easily do that to us as well. And that's what they're doing. So many countries out there are represent sort of working. They're like they're like a working class person. They go out there, they make stuff, and they you know they sell it on the uh, United States is like a mugger. It comes up and says, "Give me what you got. Let me hold you upside down by your ankles and give me what you know." Um, we ran out of time today. I had so many questions. We didn't even get to the dangerously insane Malay down in Argentina. What he's sort <laughs> of representing. Um, come back and do this again, would you? Absolutely. I'd love to. I'll, I'll conclude with one final note because you mentioned Please. like the analogy of the U.S. as the mugger. I like that. I, this, I, I owe all the credit to this to the, for this to the economist Michael Hudson. I mean, he's absolutely brilliant. And he wrote a book in the 70s that was called Super Imperialism. And he's since updated it. He recently released the third edition. And in this book, he showed how the U.S. empire is fundamentally different from the empires before it. I mean, we really are living in a historical era, because the previous empires before it, going back to, you know, you, the, the political economist Gio Giovanni Arrighi, he, and also Emanuel Wallerstein, they identified four kind of main eras of what they were in the history of, of modern history of capitalism, and what they referred to as cycles of accumulation. And you, they had the, the peak of the Dutch empire, well, the, the Italian city-states first, and then the Dutch empire, and then the British Empire, and then the U.S. Empire. But the difference is that, so in, in each of those eras, in those cycles of world accumulation, the, the dominant currency was the currency of the empire. You know, the, the Dutch currency, the, the British pound, and the U.S. dollar. However, even at the peak of the British Empire, in which the British controlled nearly one quarter of world, world land mass, Still, the, the pound was not used outside of the British sphere of influence. A little bit, but not that much. The U.S. empire is fundamentally different in the sense that not only is it not as territorialized as Britain, it doesn't physically control the land of many of these countries, but in terms of the international financial infrastructure, the U.S. has colonized basically all of the world. And until recently, basically everywhere, every country used the dollar for international trade and for their foreign exchange reserves. I mean, mm -hmm. no other country was ever able to control as much of the world economic territory, financial territory. And, and Michael Hudson showed back in the 70s when Richard Nixon took the dollar off of gold in 1971, 
because before that, after the end of World War II and the Bretton Woods system, the dollar was the international reserve currency, but it was pegged to gold. And then the other major currencies were pegged to the dollar, like in Europe. But fundamentally, it meant that all of the dollars that existed technically had to be backed by gold in this Federal Reserve at a set right price of one uh, of a one ounce of gold was 35 US dollars. However, the US began printing more and more dollars and running low in its gold reserves to pay for the war on Korea and the war on Vietnam and its growing international empire, right? And Michael Hudson showed how this led to countries exchanging their dollars for gold because they realized the dollar was actually very overvalued. And this led to a crisis. And then Richard Nixon responded by taking the dollar off of gold in 1971. And ever since then, the US has had this massive empire where its currency is used, but it doesn't need to be backed by anything, which means the US can print dollars in order to pay for imports, in order to pay for its military industrial complex. But that inflation is felt around the world because everyone uses the dollar, right? Yeah. And this is why people used to say, like the French used to complain, including, you know, Charles de Gaulle, the French, French leader after World War II, he famously complained that the US had ex an exorbitant privilege. And, and they used to say that for every $100 bill the US printed, it cost them 17 cents to print the, the $100 bill, but it was worth $100. Whereas today it costs the U.S. nothing because most of those hundred dollar bills are, you know, they're decimals on a computer screen. So this this is why de-dollarization is so important because fundamentally the U.S. empire is not like any empire before it, and it uses that financial control as a political weapon. But what we've seen really just in the past decade and really in the past few years is a massive historical shift away from that. And that's why I think it's so important to understand these geopolitical issues. Yeah. You take, a, they took themselves off the gold standard and put themselves on the bomb standard. Said, if you don't uh, like <laughs> how much money we're printing, we'll just kill you. How about that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Ben Norton for coming on the show. Uh, geopolitical Economy Report. You can check him out uh, on his website or, and there'll be links in the description, I'm sure. And as well on YouTube, you can check him out. Uh, one of the most influential and my favorite uh, analyst on all, all these things, uh, Ben Norton. Thanks for coming on. Let's chat right after this. Of course. Thanks for having me. And I'd be happy to come back in the future. All right. Bye, everybody.